Well, good morning again. It's, uh, it's great to um, have fellowship with you and uh, look at God's word with you. Um, if you're wondering what's on the screen, uh, you'll know, if you don't know who these guys are, that's fine. But if you do know who these guys are, you, you, you'll know why they're kind of on the screen. Because they've been on the news over the past few weeks, haven't they? Uh, if you know who they are, they are Oasis. And the news is Oasis are back. The reunion tour is happening. Liam and Noel, uh, Noel Gallagher have finally set aside their differences after years of feuding and have brought the, brought the band back together. And if you don't know the band Oasis, it has two members who are brothers. Uh, their, their music dominated the 90s and early 2000s. However, Liam and Noel have had a very rocky relationship uh, and it caused a massive breakup in 2009. And it was so bitter that most fans never thought that these guys would ever reconcile, let alone tour, again, tour together again. But to everyone's surprise, after 15 years, news broke that the brothers have finally reconciled. And the news got so much bigger when fans rushed to get tickets, uh, just overjoyed that the band's now back together. The thing is, reconciliation is wonderful, but it's also rare. We don't often see stories like this on the news. Stories like this in the news is rare. And in one, in one way, it's very sad to know that stories like this are rare. But something is e that's even sadder is that reconciliation is rare in God's church. It's not uncommon for brothers and sisters in Christ, when they find differences with another brother or sister, or have been wounded by them, to just simply leave the church and find another congregation to be part of. Just leaving out and not seeking any reconciliation. When we feel wronged, we'd rather break up the band. The thing is, the church isn't a band. The church is the church. And when there's a breakdown of relationships in the church, we need to seek Christ-like reconciliation. Please don't think I'm oversimplifying reconciliation. Uh, reconciliation is painful and complicated, and it takes time. This is true for all broken relationships in our lives. And it's true in 2 Corinthians. The relationship between Paul, the writer, who is an apostle, uh, who's been given God-given authority to uh, teach uh, uh, and call Christians, that the relationship between him and the Corinthian church, the people he's writing to, has broken down. And in this letter, Paul and the church are in the process of reconciling. You might not be familiar with 2 Corinthians whatsoever, but even from the portion that we've just read in this letter, there are all sorts of complex emotions running through the passage, aren't there? In this passage alone, there is sadness, there is encouragement, there is restlessness, and there's comfort. There is sorrow, and there is happiness. And at one point, you will have even noticed there is regret, but also there is no regret. This letter is complicated because reconciliation is complicated. It wouldn't have been very complicated if Paul had just said, you know what, I'm done with these guys, and just parted ways with the Corinthians. It's complicated precisely because Paul didn't give up on these people. He didn't give up on the church. And when Paul wrote this letter, they were going through ongoing issues that really needed addressing, and he does address them later on in the letter. Yet, this letter still shows that he hadn't given up on them and he still wanted to reconcile with them. Despite the division, Paul clearly loved this church. He loved them despite their disappointing failure to address sin in the church. He loved them even though they were embarrassed to be associated with him for looking weak and unimpressive. But also in return, the Corinthians got a well-deserved telling off from Paul. However, they were deeply wounded by what Paul had to say to them. They were really hurt by him. But despite this, 
the church was deeply worried for Paul when news came that his life was in danger. And also, even though what he had to say to them was really hurtful, they repented. This response actually demonstrates deep down that the Corinthians also loved Paul. They hadn't given up on him either. And as we go through this passage, my prayer is that we get in true insight into Christ-like reconciliation. And I pray that God would give us wisdom from his word to seek Christ-like reconciliation. First, we see that we reconcile by acknowledging good intentions. See, when relationships break down and emotions are high and the anger and sadness are just brimming and are overwhelming us, it's really hard to focus in on the truth. It's natural for us to feel like after we've been hurt by someone to just assume that they did it just to hurt us and they said what they said just to hurt us, they did what they did just to hurt us and to embarrass us. Now that's not impossible. Unfortunately, some people do act maliciously. They, they go out of their way to hurt us and do terrible things. But I think it would be completely wrong just to assume that someone is, or anyone and everyone is simply out to just hurt you when they say difficult things. Especially if you've heard something difficult from someone who you love, who you trust. As Christians, we can't just assume that the people around us are just spiteful. As Christians, we must value the truth and be willing to acknowledge good intentions of those who've hurt us. Paul wants the Corinthians to see that what he wanted for them was the best for them. Look at verse 2. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We've exploited no one. I do not say this to condemn you. I've said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. Paul called out the Corinthians because they needed calling out. On previous occasions, he patiently told them to deal with sinful behavior in the church, but they refused. And not only did they refuse, they undermined Paul's God-given authority as an apostle by doing it. And their behavior was so dangerous that it led them down a path that was making, taking them further and further from Christ. So out of love, Paul traveled to Corinth and gave them a serious verbal lashing in the hopes that they would turn back to Christ. If the Corinthians were to truly reconcile with Paul, they would need to acknowledge the truth by acknowledging that he had good intentions for what he did. The lie would be to say that Paul went from loving the Corinthians to just randomly condemning them for no good reason. That's the lie. But the truth was that Paul loved the Corinthians so much that he was willing to risk his relationship with them for their sake, for their, uh, for their hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul acted as an apostle under the authority of Christ when he challenged the Corinthians. But when our loved ones call us out, they might have good intentions, but sometimes we must be, must be honest that sometimes they might not go about it the right way. They might not word their displeasure of our sins in a wise way. It's, it's not what you said, it's the way you said it. And part of reconciliation is discussing and, and acknowledging that part. But their lapse of wisdom in that moment doesn't somehow cancel out their good intentions when they call you out. We acknowledge, when we acknowledge good intentions, reconciliation becomes easier. Because you recognize the love they had for you all along. If the Corinthians acknowledged Paul's good intentions, they would recognize his heart for them. They would recognize that he was actually really proud of them, as he says in the letter. Similarly, when we find ourselves in disputes and are seeking reconciliation, we must acknowledge the good intentions of the people who are calling us out. Secondly, we reconcile through comfort. Sometimes 
if you've had a difficult argument with the people you're, you love, you're left feeling so angry and hurt that after you leave, all you want to do is give them a piece of your mind again. But your intention following that argument is very important in terms of reconciliation. The difference between how you respond is the difference between division and reconciliation. Paul left Corinth after giving them that verbal lashing, not knowing how the church would respond after that painful visit. They might have completely rejected him and cut themselves off from him. So Paul wrote a letter and gave it to Titus to deliver it to them. Now, we don't have that letter, but in chapter 2, verse 4, it sa Paul says how difficult it was to write that letter and how he wrote it with tears pouring out of his eyes. Paul was already going through a difficult situation at this time as well. Look at verse 5. When we came to Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside, fears within. At this point in Paul's ministry, uh, Paul and Timothy were going through a really tough time. In chapter 1, Paul explains how they barely escaped alive from Asia just for preaching the gospel. And when they got to Macedonia, they had no rest from this harassment. And it all came from preaching the gospel. These guys were really struggling at this time. They were being bombarded with persecution. But look at how God uses this church, this Corinthian church, who've brought him so much trouble to comfort him. Look at verse 6. But God who comforts the downcast, comforted us by, coming, by the coming of Titus. Not only by his coming, but also the comfort you have given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your hardened concern for me, and that my joy was greater than ever. See, when Paul left Corinth, he didn't know how the church were going uh, to respond to him and how they felt about him. He didn't know if they would be open to reconciling with him. But by comforting him through Titus, they have shown that they have a deep love for Paul. They've shown that they are, they're really concerned for his safety. And he, he shows Paul, that God shows Paul that the Corinthians haven't given up on him. And that actually really comforts him. Because now Paul knows that there's a desire for them to reconcile. Church, we can reconcile through comfort. When there's a breakdown of a relationship with someone you've, someone things have gone tough with, you can demonstrate the desire to reconcile by comforting that person when they're going through a tough time. If you learn that someone is going through a difficult time, it's okay to reach out to them and comfort them. It demonstrates that you really care about them as a person and not just caught up in the issue that you're arguing with them. <laughs> Comforting them demonstrates that there are still differences that make that relationship challenging, but it doesn't change the fact that you care about them. Some people choose to say nothing when they see someone like that in distress, or some people do worse and they add to that person's suffering. But that option is not, allowed, not there for Christians. Paul just said it, we worship a God who comforts the downcast. And as Christians, we must, must reconcile through comfort. We must also comfort the downcast. Thirdly, and this is quite a difficult one, we reconcile through repentance, which is a way of turning away from sin and turning towards God. Sometimes we are so blind to our sins and or are so stubborn about repenting or don't want to face the costs of turning away from our sins, that it takes a true friend, a true brother or sister in Christ, to challenge us about our behavior. This friend, who normally is a source of banter and joy, pauses doing all of that to tell you that they're concerned about your behavior. They call you out, and as they're calling you out, you, you suddenly feel like a change in the nature of your relationship with them. You think, ah, you... You used to be so much fun. Why are you doing this to me now? Now, we can lie to ourselves and say we feel hurt because they just said hurtful things. Or we can be honest 
and admit that the hurt feeling comes from something true that they've said about us. When someone, closes, when someone close to you calls you out for sin, it hurts. And no matter how gently they say it, it will hurt. It will cause sorrow. But Paul says there are two types of sorrow we feel when we're challenged about our sin. And thankfully, the Corinthians felt the, the kind of sorrow that actually leads to repentance. Look at verse 9 with me. Now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. When we've been confronted about our sin, worldly sorrow is when we just feel hurt and do nothing about our sinful behavior and just rest in that mess that we're in. And that leads us to death. But godly sorrow is when we are proactive about addressing the sins that have been pointed out to us. It's a sorrow that prompts us to repent. It's a sorrow that only begins because our loved one confronted us about that sin. They helped you realize that you've been too passive about sin. And actually, it's good that you feel this sorrow, as painful as it is, but it's good that you feel it because it's motivated you to repent. One of the easiest ways to reconcile with someone after an argument with them is to ask yourself if they they had a valid point. Consider if there was something that they said that requires repenting. Ask yourself if the reason you feel hurt is because you know that they've said something about you that's true and you just didn't like it. And if it is true, let that sorrow motivate you towards godly repentance. Do not let that sadness just swirl around and and do nothing. Be proactive and repent. You know, that loved one who's challenging you about your sin is not trying to shame you or just hurt you for no reason. It's more likely that they want you to live up to the godliness that they know that you're already capable of. Look at verse 12. Even though I wrote to you, this is Paul, it was neither on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the injured party, but rather that before God, you could see for yourselves how devoted you are to us. Paul knew how godly this church was capable of being. He just wanted them to see it for themselves. When your loved one confronts you about your sin, it's because they know how precious you are and what godliness you're actually capable of being. They're calling you out because they know that your actions have not not been reflecting the godliness that they've seen in you. They're calling you out because they want you to see it for yourself. And it takes a good friend to call you out for sins like that. And if you're going to reconcile with anyone, it should be with people like that in your lives. And one of the best ways to reconcile with those people is to repent of your sin. Finally, you can reconcile through encouragement. Paul was not only encouraged by how the church repented, he was encouraged by how the church received Titus, the messenger that he sent. And as you can see, This encouragement kind of works both ways. Look at verse 13 with me. By all this, we are encouraged. In addition to our own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. I had boasted to him about you, and you have not embarrassed me. But just as everything we said to you was true, So our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. And his affection for you is all the greater when he remembers that you were all obedient, receiving him with fear and trembling. I am glad I can have complete confidence in you. Paul sent Titus to the Corinthian church, boasting about them. Now, remember... There has been a tough situation between Paul and the Corinthian church. It would have been very easy for Paul to just send Titus with a warning about the Corinthians. 
Paul could have said, these guys are bad news. You won't believe how difficult a time I've been having with them. So just be careful and you go there. Do you realize that that kind of, um, that kind of language about the Corinthians builds a tense atmosphere? And it's actually not good for reconciliation. It's very discouraging and doesn't help the situation where a relationship has broken down. He sent, instead, Paul sends Titus with encouraging words about the Corinthians. Similarly, the Corinthians wonderfully received Paul's messenger. They treated Titus so well that it refreshed Titus. And, and all of Paul's boasting was lived up to according to uh, Titus' witness about them. They received Titus so well that just from hearing Titus' um, uh, witness about them, Paul himself was encouraged. When it comes to those who have fall, that you've fallen out with, what is our language when we speak about them to others? If you've discovered that someone you know is about to meet someone you've fallen out with, what will you tell them about them? Is it encouraging or discouraging? Is it adding to the possibility of reconciliation or is it just making the relationship you have with them worse? This isn't to say that we don't highlight concerns about other people. It's, it's good to warn our friends about certain difficult things going on. But also, it's important to highlight the encouraging things about that person. To think about it this way, if the person you, follow, you have fallen out with hears that you've been saying discouraging things about them to others, does that reduce the opportunity or increase the opportunity to, opportunity to reconcile with them? However, if they hear that you've highlighted something encouraging about them through another person, surely that just kind of improves the environment for reconciliation. Do you see how Paul is not just reconciling with the Corinthians through his direct communication with them? He is reconciling with the, the Corinthians through Titus. And he's encouraging them by saying the best qualities about uh, them to Titus. And in the same way, the Corinthians are wanting to show their absolute love for Paul in how they treat Titus. And it just opens up that room for reconciliation again and again and again. Church, reconciliation is at the heart of Christianity. As Christians, our lives must be marked by reconciliation. After all, our life in Christ, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, began through reconciliation. God had the best intention for us by sending his son to take on human nature, overcome temptation, and die for our sins, defeating death and rising from the dead. His, his good intention for, for doing all of that was to reconcile with humanity. And Christ comforts us like no one else. He is the God who comforts a downcast after all. He comforts us even when we've wronged him. He calls us to repent daily because he knows that that's the best for us. He enables us to experience godly sorrow so that we repent and turn to him. And he does this because he knows the life that he's given to you is more than what you're actually living right now. He's given you a life of holiness, but when we are sinning, it is not the life that Jesus knows that we're capable of. So he brings us to godly sorrow so that we're more like him and live our life to the full in the way that he intended. He also encourages us. He never discourages us and puts us down to shame. Even though we don't deserve it, church, Jesus boasts about you throughout all of creation. He is so proud of calling you his church. So we reconcile to others because God first reconciled with us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that reconciliation is hard. That's why we ask you to supply us with your endless grace as we seek reconciliation with our brothers and sisters. Help us to remember how you sent your son so that we could be reconciled with you 
Help us to follow Jesus' pattern in our lives. Lord, we thank you that Jesus boasts about us because he loves us so much. And Lord, we ask that you enable us to live, live up to the way that Christ has called us to. For his glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.